the book of Numbers is a part of the Torah. Uh, it is the part of the biblical text that captures God's earliest revelation to a people that uh, were certainly and have historically been known as uh, the nation of Israel, the people of the land in uh, what is now modern day uh, Palestine, Israel, North Africa, people that uh, had a revelation, an encounter with God and, and God over generations continued to reveal God's self to uh, this particular people. It does indeed underscore uh, that relationships are forged over time. And how many know you can have an initial encounter with someone and that encounter could be transformative, but it can also be short-lived. But when there is an investment over time, that investment of time allows for growth allows for knowledge, allows for feelings, it allows for revelation. And this is the way God chose to reveal God's self to uh, humankind, particularly over a trajectory of time. It is not to suggest that God was not actively engaging with any other peoples in the earth. But what we do have through the Hebraic scriptures, the biblical text, is God's revelation to a people over time. And what we learn in this revelation of God to people over time is that God is not overly concerned with who you are today. God has a deep investment of who you are over the course of your life. That God may meet you today, or you may meet God today, but God has an eye on both your eternal existence. The scripture says in Jeremiah chapter number one, that before you were formed in your mother's womb, God says, I knew you. That's a powerful declaration by God. Because it takes a lot of the... Uh, attribution of your life and your constitution. It takes it essentially out of the hands of your parents and it introduces the divine. Can you imagine how differently many of our lives would unfold if we were really conscious to the fact that before you were formed in your mother's womb, God knew you. God had fellowship with you. You were so significant that God stopped by to see you before you even saw the world. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, I am somebody. Amen. God, God knew me before my mom and them did. <laughs> Hello, somebody. And what that means is that just like God revealed God's self to the Hebrew Jewish people through the text and the experiences over four, five, six thousand years, God is still revealing God's self to you over the course of your existence. And so here we're just going to jump into this passage in the book of Numbers because it does capture God's admonition, caution, but also invitation to the children of Israel, to the progeny, the patriarchs, and I will even expand this to the matriarchs, if you will, those who are charged with helping facilitate generational consistency and generational legacy. Numbers chapter number 14, we find the children of Israel, they have left Egypt on their way to the promised land, and they've run into some challenges, just like many of us do on the way to our promised land. How many ever 
left the place that you were familiar with. You didn't like it very much. But then you get out there on your way to what you hope is a better place, and you run into trouble. And then you start to think, man, she wasn't as bad as I thought. <laughs> he wasn't as bad as I thought. Man, that life, you know, I know it was rough, but at least I was familiar with the devil that I knew versus this devil I don't know. Anybody ever had that experience? Amen. You set out to move towards the promised land, and it demonstrates such challenge that you begin to think twice about staying on the journey. This is a human experience. It is not something reserved for a small group of people, but throughout the process, sometimes we can pick up bad habits along the way, and God gives us an invitation to not allow those habits, not allow those vices, not allow those challenges to continue, but to take advantage of who God reveals God's self to be. So let us jump into the text. Numbers chapter 14, verse 17 through 24. The scripture says, And now I pray thee, let the power of the Lord be great as thou hast promised, saying, The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love forgiving iniquity and transgression, but the Lord will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of fathers upon children, upon the third and upon the fourth generation. So pardon the iniquities of this people, I pray thee, according to the greatness of thy steadfast love. And according as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Here in this text, Moses is acknowledging to God that there is a side of the universe of human experience with the divine that says that you do indeed reap what you sow. That if you put the wind out in the world, you're going to weep the whirlwind. That if you put evil and wickedness out into the world that will find its way back to you it is the law of nature so Moses is acknowledging this as the divine characteristics but Moses is also describing that God even though I know this is true I also know you to be a God who is slow to anger I also know you to be a God who abounds in steadfast love I also know you to be a God who forgives iniquity and transgression. And I also know you to be a God who has great steadfast love for the people. This juxtaposition of that which is fixed in the universe, but also is able to be thwarted by the loving characteristics of God consistently creates what I call a colossal cataclysmic showdown between God's great love for us and that which we deserve to receive from our own actions. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? God stands in the gap when we ask God to stand in the gap. And I am someone who has experienced God standing in the gap even when I don't ask God to. Mm -hmm. So let's keep reading verse number 20. It says, Then the Lord responded, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live and as the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs which I wrought in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the proof these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice, shall see the land which I swore to give to their fathers. None of those who despise me shall see it, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land into which he went, 
listen to this, and his descendants shall possess it. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. For the next few minutes, just going to talk from the title, We Are Cycle Breakers. We are cycle breakers. Let's pray. God, we want to say thank you for the word that is a lamp unto our feet. The word that is a light unto our path. I pray, God, that you will bless me as I stand here to preach and teach your word. Send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray that the people of God say amen. The biblical text is very clear. And life has shown us, particularly in these most recent months and years, that there are cycles in our lives that deserve to be broken. There are habits and sensibilities, ways of being in the world that you may not be able to lay claim or full responsibility to creating because many of us don't get to choose the families we're born into. Dare I say, none of us do. How many know that all of us show up in somebody's life without our own permission? But the longer you live, the more you have the ability to decide who you will be. Will you be the best of what God has created and intended, or will you be a shadow of your potential? And this is the great dilemma I find for us as people who are seeking the ways of God with the backdrop of this fallen, troubled society. Because it is not as if everything in our lives and our experiences are neutral. How many of you can be honest and say, I can think of many a time in my life where I was pushed in the wrong direction? Hello, somebody. I know I ain't been here in a couple of weeks, amen, but amen. I still believe that we got some folk that's going to tell the truth today up in here. That there are moments in our journey where good was present and so was evil. And I got nudged in a direction that I was trying to resist. Kind of like. Don Corleone in Godfather 3, he said, just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back. Anybody ever been pulled into something that you were trying to resist? And if the truth be told, what often pulls us is anger. What often pulls us is fear. What often pulls us is pain. What often pulls us is trauma. And against the backdrop of God continuously describing God's self to us as one who can transform you from who you are today to who God intends for you to be, there is another force that is always trying to pull you in another direction. It is here that I believe this colossal, Cataclysmic showdown happens consistently where we are being invited to name, number one, that we are not neutral agents in the world. We must make a choice. And we must make a decision about who we will be in light of who we are. We must make a choice about what kind of father I will be in light of who I am today. What kind of mother, what kind of caregiver, what kind of mentor, what kind of son and daughter and child and community member, what kind of human being will I be in light of who I am today? While I know God is acting 
actively working on my behalf to turn me into who God intended me to be. I want you to know, beloved, that you and I can choose today that I will not continue cycles, habits, dispositions that I know are a residual of anger, fear, pain, and trauma. I will not be blind to the history of my journey, but I also will not allow my history to determine my future. I will decide. Somebody say, I will decide. I will choose. Somebody say, I will choose. I will decide and I will choose to break some cycles. Because what is at stake if I don't is that the sins of my past and the generational curses that predate me will be thrust onto the children and their children without their permission. And if you and I had the power to break a generational curse so it does not get unwillingly thrust on your children, why would we not do all that is within our power to say, not on my watch, not in my journey. If I got to go to therapy, I will go. If I have to go see some help, I will go. If I have to say I'm sorry, I will say it. If I have to learn how to interact with my family and my partner and my community differently so I will not reinscribe the same pathology in the next generation, and I will learn it. Because if I don't learn it, then it means that I am passing down to another generation something that God is saying, I will show up with you today and help you to break some cycles. Lord, I, I, I wish I had the energy to preach this like I feel it today, but, 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 just, but, just, but just tell yourself, I must break some cycles today. I, I must break some cycles. There, there are three quick things I'm, I'm going to lift up. The first that the text says is, I must identify generational sins. One of the first ways to break cycles is to name and to acknowledge, as the scripture says, there have been some things that have been thrust upon us that we did not ask for. And I want you to, to, to receive this point without guilt or shame because there is no family that is perfect. There is no history that is pristine. You could be a tongue-talking family from the womb, and you still got to identify some generational challenges. And you could be a family that ain't never seen God, heard of God, and don't want to be with God. And you still got to decide to break some generational challenges. We as a country have generational challenges. And part of our challenge is that we want to live ahistorically in the world as if the Sins of the generations before us are not still being visited upon us today. Lord, I wish I could talk to somebody in here today. I'm so blessed and encouraged by our very own pastor, Tanisha Walton. Because she has quietly been leading, co-leading the Berkeley Unified School District Reparations Committee. And they have just submitted in the last couple of weeks recommendations for cash payments to be made to black families in the Berkeley Unified School District. Mm -hmm. you, ought to, you, ought to, you ought to clap it up for that. Which is part of a broader movement across the country, particularly here in the state of California, to ensure Number one, that we identify the generational sin of slavery and anti-black racism and exclusion. 
Now, there are those in the world who want to live in today's world as if they are not benefiting or at a disadvantage because of the historical legacy of generational sins. Some people can only receive this point with shame and guilt rather than with opportunity and integrity. Now it's always easy to start with the macro before we get to the individual, so just buckle your seat belts because we, we coming to the individual. Shame and guilt versus opportunity and integrity. There are those who will say, well, I was not here. So why should I be responsible? But I remember the words of Abraham, Joshua Heschel, a rabbi, who said that few are guilty, but all are responsible. Which just is to say that there are a very few number of people who may have done a deed. But the collective among us have a responsibility to repair the harm. Rather than internalizing the acknowledgement of generational sins through shame and guilt, I want to invite us to imagine the invitation through opportunity and integrity. That because we all live in an interdependent world, I cannot be free totally from the consequences of the decisions of others. Now, just one basic way I can drive this point home <clears throat> is through the example of rush hour traffic. How many of you have ever been in rush hour traffic? And you are trying to get to your destination. Everything that is within you is quite responsible. You've left on time. You have gas in your car. All of your turn signals work. Your steering wheel works. Your car functions optimally, and yet you can be on the road with hundreds of other people who obviously don't have working traffic lights or turn signals, who obviously have only the brake on their car, who obviously their steering wheel does not work, and you even though you have agency, are left limited by the decision-making of others. Beloved, your life is often seasonally just this way. You may have done everything right, but there may be those in your family, on your job, in your neighborhood, at your school, who have, through their decision-making, overly impacted your life. And the most important act of self-awareness is to acknowledge that there are times in your life when you are that person as well. Few are guilty. All of us are responsible. I may not have done the deed today, but if I can look back over my life, I know I did do a deed one day. I harmed someone one day. I hurt someone one day. And just like I said before, the law of the universe says that it will come back to you. But one way I have found God to intervene in the, 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 the consequence of the clapback, if you will, is when you identify your error 
and say, I will with integrity and opportunity make this right. This is how we break cycles. We must be a people who can be honest with the conditions that have produced us, with the reality of who we are, with all of our growing edges. edges. I am someone who God is still working on. I want to believe I'm a superlative human being. And then people in rush hour traffic. They, they pulled things out of me that I thought were under the blood, as they say. That I thought I had worked out through prayer and fasting. I thought I worked out through the speaking in other tongues and swinging from the chandeliers and rolling on the floor. I thought I worked it all out, and then I get into the rush hour traffic of my life. And other people can trigger and pull things out that I thought was all the way gone. I want you to know, beloved, identifying generational sins is so important. The second thing that you and I must think through is how frequent and consistently can we seek out pardons? Everybody say opportunity. Everybody say integrity. Say it again, opportunity and integrity. If you have integrity and if you are taking advantage of opportunity, then you will, as often as is needed, seek out pardons for yourself and others who have harmed you. This is the hardest thing for many of us because some folks have injured us deeply. I'm talking about a wound that is hard to heal over time. I'm talking about a betrayal that is hard to get over. But if God can pardon our iniquities, think of all the times that we sinned against God. Think of all the times we've fallen short and God, as the scripture says, is steadfast in God's love. And I want to say this right. Slow to anger and constantly forgiving iniquity and transgression. God is inviting you to be a person who's open to breaking cycles by seeking and giving out pardons. And I'm here to tell you, as I do work and we do work in our communities, this is the hardest thing to do. Because when you feel justified in your anger, and you want retribution. There's a part of you that says, don't be no punk. <laughs> they don't let them punch you. They don't let them punk you, bruh. They did what? Nah, bruh. Nah, 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 no, no, no. It's a lot of no's going through your head that is trying to convince you of something that God is whispering in your ear. When you don't seek and receive pardons, you set yourself up for consequences you will never be able to handle. I have many young, young fellas, young, young men that I've worked with through the years who are in jail and prison today. And they felt justified. But 20 years into their sentence, at the age of 40, they'll tell me, man, McBride, I wish I could go back and talk to my 16-year-old self. 
Because everything that I thought justified my decision, I lost more on the other side than I had lost pre my decision. Hello, somebody. It is important for us to ask God for forgiveness. It is important for us to ask our neighbors for forgiveness. And it is important for us to extend forgiveness even before you get asked. Because those who do not forgive are like individuals eating rat poison, waiting for the mouse to die. Unforgiveness is poison. And it will harm you much more than it will harm the individual you are holding your forgiveness from. So questions, how do we seek God's forgiveness and restoration? What healing must be done? Because that is a part of the opportunity and integrity of seeking pardons. Offering pardons and forgiveness cannot happen apart from healing work. Because you got to get underneath the harm. And I know, brothers, you know, this is why I'm, I'm thankful for this movement that we are creating across the country because there has been a lot of harm inflicted on the bodies and the hearts and the minds of men, of women, of children, and we do not have enough spaces scaled up across the country to heal the harm. So we just ask people, keep going. Keep going. And how many know you can keep going for a minute? I've been sick the last couple of weeks. I, it, I, I've been tested negative for COVID, but I'm wearing a mask anyway. Somebody say amen, because I don't want no problems. <laughs> but I, since I've been going on maybe three, four weeks, I've cut all sugar out of my diet. Because I realized that I got to do something extraordinary <laughs> to get this body back together. Somebody say amen. amen. I can't be eating Twinkies and Ding Dongs and cupcakes. Talk about why am I sick all the time. Yeah. Somebody say extraordinary. extraordinary. Well, how many know for your soul and spirit to be healed, you can't keep doing what you've been doing. Yeah. Talking about I'm healed. You go to work the same amount of hours. You watch TV the same amount of hours. You don't introduce anything new and radical into your routine that can help heal the part of you that the TV and work cannot heal. Beloved, there's something radical that you gotta introduce into your life, and for some of us, that's healing work. Somebody say healing work. And God can heal you through all kinds of spiritual practices. God can heal you through all kinds of somatic practices. God can heal you through all kinds of bodily and physical exercise. God can heal you through a therapeutic practice. God can heal you through the spiritual disciplines. God can heal you in all kinds of ways. But the question is, this is our last point. The last thing that God said about Caleb, he said the reason Caleb is getting access into the promised land, listen, said because Caleb has a different spirit. Lord, I, I hope, beloved, you understand the day that you break a cycle when you get a different spirit. You become a new person. You invite God to give you a new makeover. You invite God to take the materials that you're working with and to reconstitute you into someone new. Amen. And I want you to know, beloved, who you are today is not who you have to be tomorrow. Whew. Who you have been for 5, 10, 20, 30 years of your life, one of the best and greatest gifts of our tradition of Christianity is we believe in the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Spirit of God to inhabit your material life 
and radically change you into something brand new. The lectionary passage says it like this. If anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, everything has become new. And I want you to know, beloved, that God wants to make you brand new today. God wants to help you to have a different kind of heart. So you can see the hurt of the world and not just go along and say, I'm just going to be out for me and mine. No, I'm going to show up as a citizen of the world. I'm going to speak out against the genocide in Palestine and the genocide in East Oakland and the genocide in the Sudan and the genocide in Ethiopia and Tigray. I will not be someone who is complicit in the old way of life when God has given you and I the opportunity to decide that I will be brand new. And beloved, I want you to know God wants to make you brand new. God wants to change your identity. God wants to change your personhood. God wants to change your mind and your heart and your spirit. You need not leave here the same But you can't leave brand new. Oh, there's a song we used to sing. And it says, since he came into my life, what a wonderful change has come over me. Listen to this. I looked at my hands and they look new. I looked at my feet, and they did too. He changed my mind, changed my heart. You know, these just ain't old songs. These old saints used to sing. They are testimonies. And I want you to know, beloved, that can be your testimony. You need not die who you are today. God says, I can make you and your family's lineage <laughs> brand new come on stand with me everyone and let's take a few moments to pray grab the hand of someone next to you God I pray for the person I'm touching today they are my neighbor. They are my beloved. They've been given to me as a sacred companion on this day, for this moment, to have a genuine encounter with deciding and choosing to be made new. I pray, God, that you will help love and peace and power channeled through the body of the one I'm touching. I pray that healing would erupt within them from their soul and their spirit. I pray that they will decide today that they will break a generational curse, both in their own life, but also in the life of this society and world. God, if we come from families that are dysfunctional, that are abusive, God, we declare and decree today, we decide that we will do what is necessary to ensure that this cycle does not continue. And God, we acknowledge the social responsibility we have that in a world defined by racism, misogyny, by exclusion and economic exploitation by war and violence, we, God, will decide today to break that cycle. That we will not go along with the insatiable appetite of warmongers and greedy corporate, governmental, political, corporate forces that would extract that which you have given to the world as more than enough. God, we will be citizens of the world that follow your ways. So God, I pray that we will ask for forgiveness. I pray that my beloved that I'm touching today, God, may they be open 
to forgiveness. May they forgive themselves. Squeeze their hand gently. May they forgive themselves for what they've not been able to do. May they accept that now is an opportunity to move forward and you will meet them along the way to bridge the harms and to erase the trauma, to cause families and communities to be reconciled. Oh God, I pray for my beloved today to emerge with a different spirit. It need not take years to have a different spirit. It just takes moments to make a decision that on this day, Father's Day 2024, I am emerging from this holy encounter with a new spirit. I will not be who I have been, but I will be brand new. My hands will look new. My feet will look new. My heart will be new. My spirit, my mind, my soul will be new. God, I say thank you for being a cycle breaker. Now lift your hands right where you're standing. It's me, Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother. It is not my father. It is not my sister nor my brother, but it's me, oh Lord, and I need you, God. I need you, God, to heal me. Set me free from anger, fear, pain, and trauma. Cause me, God, to be an agent of reconciliation. Thank you, God, for keeping me alive. Through all of my hardships, through all of my trials, through all of my mistakes, through all of my missteps, through all of the times I let myself down, I let my children down, I let my family down, I let my community down. God, you kept oxygen in my body so I can redeem the time that is left. And so, God, today I say yes to you, God. Fill me up. Make me brand new and do it for your glory. Do it for your pleasure. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, somebody, just say, I am a cycle breaker. Say it, I am a cycle breaker. Come on, say it again. I'm breaking some cycles today. Hug two or three people and tell them, I see you breaking some cycles today. Tell them that I see you breaking a cycle or two. I see you breaking a cycle or two. You need not carry it on for another generation, but it stops with you today. Oh, come on, somebody. You ought to celebrate that. It stops with you today. Today is the best day of the rest of your life. It's only going to get better from here. It's only going to get better. I have a witness that believes that today, that God can make it better, that the promised land is still within your reach for you and your family, our communities. God is not unfaithful to his word. If God said it, God's going to give us all we need to accomplish it. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, give the Lord a hand. Praise one more time, everybody.